So it starts the recording now. All right. So welcome, everyone, again. This is the hands-on exercise in natural language processing. And um, yes, thanks for joining for our two-day workshop. We had a lot of registrations, and I'm glad uh, that it finally starts. OK, so first of all, um, let me start with what we are going to do today in this lecture session. Um, so this is divided in theory and practice. I said it's a hands-on workshop, but because we were do doing it online, it's a bit tricky to combine hands-on with actual hands-on where I could, you know, look over your shoulder and tell you what to code. So the coding will mostly be done on my end, but I will try to make sure that all of the code is accessible to you, that you can run the code and uh, that you can if you want, also run the code while I'm doing it on the lecture. So you can see that you can reproduce all of the results. And ideally, after the lecture, um, you can take the code base and do your own um, programming on it. So it's still divided in theory and practice, this lecture. So for the theory, I will give you a light introduction to natural language processing, where I'll be focusing on understanding and uh, producing. Then I'll show you some examples of these basics that we just learned in the theory. This would be the first bit of uh, hands-on that we're going to use. Also, um, feel free, again, to raise any questions in the chat. If you have any problems understanding me, you can also try to turn on the uh, captions. Meet has auto-generated captions that might be helpful um, if you want to uh, read uh, while I'm speaking. Um, and then lastly, yes, let's go back to the theory parts. Uh, I will also talk about word embeddings and language models, which, which is a bit more advanced uh, NLP topics. And then last but not least, we will invent our data, a bit of data that then in the second part of the um, practice, uh, we will then analyze this data. All right, my screen is still shared, all right, just checking this. All right, and then in the practice part, which will be mostly about coding, but it will be guided coding. So I will uh, use extensive uh, explanations to make sure that we can all follow up on the code. And um, again, you can follow the code in my lecture or you can follow it afterwards or um, whenever you, you want. Okay, so both of these blocks are going to be approximately one and a half hours hopefully leaving enough time for questions. So we have now one and a half hours. And then uh, later, uh, we are also going to have a little break of half an hour. And then we're going to have more hands-on practice. OK, so quick uh, introduction of myself. Who am I and why I'm doing this? So my name is Philip Wicker. I am a PhD student at the University College in Dublin. And I'm the head of AI applications at AI for People and the uh, organizer of this workshop. So um, my background is in cognitive science, and I've been teaching programming for the last five years. And there is a bit of more information if you're interested. Um, but more interestingly, why am I doing this? So this workshop is uh, pretty much in line with what AI for People stands for. And then one big aspect is about bridging the gap between technology and society. So I want to share my knowledge with you. And I want to uh, also enjoy the teaching uh, that I'm doing with you now. Uh, again, uh, let me quick have a look at the attendance. So we now have 66 people. I can see one of you has not disabled their webcam. I can, uh, would like to point this out again. This is just to save some bandwidth. Uh, yes, I see somebody just noticed it. Thank you very much. Um, yes, and I would like to start with the first um, little bit of interactive parts. Um, I would like to have a quick overview on the chat so I can see that you are all responsive and awake. Um, if you could just, I mean, you don't have to do it, but I would like to know how many people are joining us from uh, the European continent. If you could just say, I don't know, EU in the chat, if you're from the European continent, then I can see. Okay. 
It is. I mean, I'm not going to count this, but I can see the chat is responsive. And somebody is half awake in the EU. Okay, so the next would be who is joining us from, oh, wow, most people, it seems. Who is joining us from the uh, Asian continent? You can say, I don't know, Asia. Yeah. Okay. India counts as Asia to me. Okay. Okay. All right. So now I have to make the full round. Who's joining us from Australia? Somebody from Australia? Okay. Hmm. Okay, still people from Asia. Okay. Nobody seems to be from Australia. Do we have somebody from, let's put it like the American continent? North or South America? You say, okay. I just left the meeting. <laughs> okay, this is not a survey, right? This is just to see that everyone is responsive and that you can hear me clearly and that we have a bit of engagement before we start with the uh, theory part. Okay, and then what did I miss? Uh, Antarctica? I'm not sure. Um, but I think we're good here. Africa. Of course, I knew it, right? Um, so Africa, we have two people from Africa. No, I know that uh, Kevin is one of the AI for People members. So that brings me back to the topic, AI for People. Um, yes, what is AI for People? Because some of you uh, heard of AI for People for the first time now. And um, I quickly want to spend uh, a little overview on this. So we have these three sections that we mainly divide our work in. That is AI policy, AI research, and AI applications. And uh, I'm the head of the AI applications, and we basically all work together as one big team. But one part of our mission is to uh, make AI more accessible for people and also talk about the ethics and implications of um, artificial intelligence. And you can find more information on our website as well. So let's start with the actual topic. I can, again, see another webcam, um, just to let you know. So an introduction to natural language processing. Uh, let's start with the basics. So basically, natural language processing, or NLP, can be understood as the, um, as the intersection between linguistics and artificial intelligence. Right? I mean, there's lots of different definitions that you can apply to this. But especially from my background on the linguistics and the AI, um, I think this is the most appropriate to define it like this. And it basically means it's giving computers the ability to understand and use language. So here's an example of natural languages on the right side. And on the left side, we have programming languages. Because you can uh, could already argue uh, saying, well, a computer already speaks a language, namely a programming language. Um, so why can't we, uh, why can't, why, why do we even talk about natural language as a difference to programming languages? So on the right hand side, uh, you can see the natural languages. Um, I'm assuming most of you uh, hopefully speak English, otherwise it will be uh, hard to follow. And on the left hand side, you see numerous programming languages. Um, we will mostly concern ourselves in this uh, course and for the uh, workshop with Python. But of course, there's numerous other programming languages. Same with natural languages. So what seems to be um, the difference here? So let's just say we want to distinguish between programming language and natural language. So programming language, as most of you might know, has a very distinct, uh, distinct syntax that you will need to follow. So here, for example, in the Python programming language, I highlighted the most important syntactical uh, keywords in orange. So you can see that there is a clear syntactic structure that you need to follow in order to um, speak or use this programming language. Whereas with natural language, it's sort of a bit different. I took this example from my favorite linguist, Chomsky here, uh, who said human language is based on an elementary property that also seems to be biologically isolated, property of discrete infinity. So what Chomsky means by this 
is that human language, and in his uh, explanation, he also puts it in contrast to animal language, human language is discrete and, in, uh, and has infinity <laughs> property. That means it is certain words, not continuous sounds like animals can do them. I mean, for us, it's discrete units, the words, and we can start expanding those words. We can create new words or we can use them in new uh, ways, which is creating this infinity aspect of human language. And this might not be enough to distinguish natural language from programming language. As a programming language, you also seem to have these this discrete units, the syntax. But here's the, the tricky part about natural language. I'm going to show you a few examples of natural language. For example, here's the sentence, despite the constant negative press, coffee. Or we have the sentence, there's nothing you can say if you don't get a Pinocchio. Or you can say sinks, right? Showers and what goes with a sink? A shower, 10 times, right? 10 times. Bong bong, not me, of course, not me, but you, you. So these are all uh, three examples of natural language provided by the um, president of the US. And this is just to show that there's really, really different ways of using natural language, which can be metaphorical, which would be the Pinocchio example, uh, which can be embodied, but because if I were to show you the body language that the president is using when he's talking about sinks and showers, it would make more sense to understand his bong bong, not me. And uh, then we also have evolving and dynamic aspects of language, which would be the neologism of uh, Kofefi. So these are properties of natural language that we usually cannot find in programming. Of course, right, you can always argue programming language is also somewhat evolving over time, uh, but less so metaphorical, and at least so embodied. Um, yes, so an introduction to natural language now. Um, first of all, if we just want the computer to understand and use English language, we could say, okay, the computer should say, hello world, I understand English language. Ideally, as we know that a computer um, that a computer is uh, rule-based, we could just say, okay, let's define the English language with a set of rules, and we just take those rules and put them in the computer, and then the computer is able to understand, speak, and use uh, English. The problem with this is English language has all of these uh, figurative language. So a metaphor, simile, hyperbole, idiom, sarcasm. And then uh, we also have, as I said before, gestures or cultural dynamics and cultural context um, or just context. Um, all right. So this is a problem if we were to just define um, the language by rules. So, but still what we do have is all of these um, speech in and output devices like uh, Cortana, Siri, and Alexa example. So how did we get there? How did we turn these rules that are not seem to be universal into these systems? Well, here's an example. And we start with the very basics. Uh, here's a quote from uh, the 1930s of these animal crackers. So it says, while hunting in Africa, I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How it got into my pajamas, I don't know. Right? So we can see that this um, joke here uh, stems from the fact that there is a certain um, that there is a certain parsing happening, and we're going to look into this. So, if I look into the sentence from a computer perspective, what I can do from the most elementary uh, point of view from the English language, I can say, well, we have approximately nine types of fundamental English words. We have nouns, we have interjections, we have adjectives, conjunctions, verbs, adverbs, articles and pronouns and prepositions and prepositions. So these are the nine fundamental types of English words that you can identify in most English sentences. And now what you can do with those, you take your sentence that you have, you analyze your sentence, and you can identify the parts of the speech uh, relevant for your English language. So here, this is a bit more advanced, like linguistic, um, uh, a syntax, so you can say the while is a subordinate conjugate, and hunting is a verb, and in is the apposition, and so forth. Right, so you can parse the sentence based on the part of speech 
that's what it's called. So this is called part of speech tagging, or in short, pause tagging. And what you can also do, if you know that there are certain rules in the English language where these parts of speech follow a certain sequence or become necessary or antecedents for other parts of speech, what you can do is you can create uh, what's called a dependency parsing. So with that dependency parsing, you can analyze the structure uh, behind this sentence. And this is basically why the joke is uh, happening, because there is an error in the dependency parsing. You're automatically attributing the pajamas to uh, the speaker and not to the elephant. And then in the resolution of the joke, you realize it was about the uh, elephant. Uh, it's never fun to Um, to ask right now, you can still ask them, and uh, my uh, colleague Kevin will write them down, and we, he will pass them on to me for the Q and A session afterwards. So just feel free or write them down yourself and keep them for the Q and A. But also write again, post them in the chat whenever you want. Uh, all right, so let's look at a few examples of. Um, let's say you're writing, you're having a system like the Google, uh, your, your Google phone uh, assistant, and you ask the question, where's the nearest fuel station? How many days until Christmas? Or what's the stock price of Tesla, right? So you can have all of those questions. And how does the system then recognize these things? So internally, what it can do, it, it, it can actually do this part of speech tagging and identity um, recognition. So for example, these building blocks now can be identified as location or dimension or a noun or quantity and event, things like this. So for example, Google handles this the following way. There is this, so the search engine is connected to uh, the Google knowledge graph, which entails about 70 billion facts, right? And um, what it then does in that graph, it would look at all of these building blocks and try to find them within the graph. So what's the stock price of Tesla? And here's a quantity, it entails a noun, and it entails a brand. So it just picks the um, it just picks the brand, and then from there it finds the quantity of the nouns, and then it could return the stock price to you. Um, so this is what's called the input for the natural language understanding. And example of uh, how good this works. So if I say What's the stock price of Tesla? Okay, so this was um, interesting to see because what happened now, within an instant, my natural language input got read into the system, got parsed, got pause tagged, got evaluated, went into the knowledge graph, retrieved the information, turn it into German because my phone is set to German, and then created the synthesized speech to output this in German to me. And I think that's quite impressive if you consider all the little steps in between. And the step we've only covered so far from the basic explanation is, I mean, unless you couldn't hear it, uh, right, try it for yourself. I mean, you know how these things work. So this was the input, the natural language understanding part. But since we're talking about uh, NLP, we also have to look at the natural language generation. So the output part where the system gives you a response. And um, yes, so as far as the theory is concerned, we now talked about the understanding parts uh, of the natural language processing. And now we talk about the production part of the natural language processing. So that area is called natural language generation. And natural language generation goes way back until like the 1960s. There was this very famous example uh, called ELISA. So ELISA was uh, written at MIT, and it basically um, simulates conversation using, using very simple forms of pattern matching and substitutions. So you were uh, posting uh, a text to the system, and the system was basically giving you the illusion of understanding of understanding you by, and there was the trick that they used. Um, 
So they were not even uh, contextualizing the events in any sort of a greater framework, um, but what they were doing is they were using scripts. And those scripts, they were based on this psychological parroting. So for example, if you were to say, um, uh, I'm doing fine, how are you? Then the system could respond, uh, could respond I'm doing fine, uh, why are you doing fine? It was just simply taking the input and rephrasing it as a question to, to most parts. So it was based on these very easy scripts. And even this simple approach uh, led to um, astonishing results. For this is just a very brief, um, brief first example of natural language generation because from ELISA in the 1960s to modern chatbots, we came a very, very long way. And uh, that way was basically enabled through one thing that is uh, the big uh, topic today, and you might already guess it, right? We have been producing incredible amounts of data by using our chats, by using our phone, by using our emails, all mostly provided by uh, big tech companies that were gathering all of this data. And what they could do with this data then is uh, machine learning sub-branch of AI. Uh, that enabled us to get away from these script-based approaches of using simple substitutions, to really like giving a computer the ability to learn the structures and patterns in language. And uh, yes, so natural language generation nowadays, when it comes to machine learning, the big words here are uh, word embeddings and language models, which will be the later part um, of this lecture. Uh, which brings me now to our first example, where I want to show you some very few uh, rudimentary basics of natural language processing. So um, what I will do for this is I will use certain uh, natural language packages. And here's a little overview, because, I mean, there's a lot of those. And I will not go into detail of all of each and, and every one of them, but just as an overview. Uh, for example, we have the Natural Language Toolkit, um, I'm not going to go into all of the uh, pros and cons of each of them, but just to give you an overview of those. Um, the one that I will be focusing on now um, is SpaceI, which is the one that we're uh, here. Uh, so SpaceI was meant for, um, uh, for applications, so it's really fast, it has a fast syntactic parser, and it's really meant for like um, hands-on solutions and not specifically for research. Um, whereas the other ones on the left-hand side, you see NLTK and Core NLP and Jensen, and will we will we be using a few of those as well in the uh, second half of this lecture? Um, are more focused on um, research, so they are really really common. They are widespread. They are fast, and they work quite well, and they have a good documentation. Then there are a few others. For example, here I have. Um, polyglot, which really works for using different languages if you want to compare or use or understand different languages. Then you have, for example, uh, the scikit-learn package also has uh, NLP cap capabilities, um, but this is embedded in an overall really big machine learning library. And then you have, for example, pattern library, which is good for uh, web mining or accessing other APIs if you want to get other data into your system. And uh, yes, we will be looking at a bit of NLTK, Jensen, and text blob for uh, sentiment analysis later on. But now the very first example uh, is uh, Spacey that I want to show you, just because I feel um, to also show something that is more um, applicable for real life applications and something that is very easy to use. Um, so for this, we have our uh, first hands-on now. And for the hands-on, you basically can just follow my tutorial here. Everything will be available. If you want to code, uh, my screen is still visible. It says, sorry, can I quickly confirm that my screen is visible? OK, is it visible again? Was that happening for a long time? <laughs> Somebody else was presenting. OK. Please do not present while I'm presenting. Thank you. All right. Um, so if you want to be coding with me, um, I mean, you can do it. But I think it's better if you follow my lecture and the screen that I'm sharing with you right now. But you can also do that later on. So what you can do is you can go to 
uh, colab.research.google.com, which is Google's uh, very easy uh, online to use uh, Jupyter Notebook interface. And if you go to it, you can then go to, uh, if you want to start a new um, notebook, a new coding session, you can select GitHub. And then if you go to our GitHub, the AR for people Git, uh, if you enter this in the GitHub URL, you can access all of the um, coding that will be done by me and also by my other colleagues in the next two days. And we have prepared um, those notebooks for you. So you select the notebook that we would need. So for now, it will be the um, SpaceI demo. And this is already going a bit ahead. So I'm doing this right now. Please uh, let me know. So I'm doing the same. If you can see, shall we have the links in the chat? Yes, I will do that right now. And Kevin can support me. So we go to um, yes, we go to Google. So collab.research.google. Uh, I'm assuming you can still see my screen, right? And then you click on GitHub, and then you enter the kit here. Enter, and then this allows me to open the space I demo. If you have any technical issues with this right now, um, we will have to deal with it later. But we've tested it multiple times, so it technically should work. All you need is a, a Google account, but maybe not even that. So um, can you all see my code right now, the spacey demo? Yes, OK, thank you. Um, all right, so let's dive into this. Here are a few examples. Let me just quickly um, clear my output so that you can see that this is all um, really happening. So basically, what the Google um, Colab Notebook allows me is um, what the Google Colab Notebook allows me to do here is I can have text, right? So this is actual text, but I'm explaining my code. I can insert links. I can insert images. I can insert whatever I want. This is a markup just to show you here. And um, it also allows me to put in code cells. So let's first, in this notebook, uh, we can check the version of the Python uh, that we are currently using on this instance. So we're basically accessing a new, um, a new instance of a machine. So basically, now Google provides me with a computer somewhere that I'm accessing. Whenever you are leaving this, um, this notebook, the server will shut down. It will delete everything that was on there. But you can use it for 12 hours completely free and install whatever you, uh, you want. So now I've checked. So we have Python 3.6 installed. And now what this, um, what this thing allows me to do, I've created this regular expression. So I'm saying uh, pip, so the package manager. And I'm basically asking the machine to list. You can see here, list me the version of all, this is basically my expression that I want to look for. I'm looking for NLTK, SpaceSci, GenSim, Core NLP. So all of these packages that I've just mentioned to you, and if I run this on the machine, we can see that already GenSim, NLTK, SpaceSci, all of them have already been installed. Because um, that's probably what most of the people use if they use these notebooks. Um, so now the next thing um, that I can do here is uh, some basic NLP um, uh, exercises. So next, we uh, will import the space side package, right? So those of you who are not familiar with Python, you kind of like have to bear with me for now. And those of you, for example, who attended my coding class should be somewhat familiar with this. So we're basically importing here. Um, the space side package um, that we've just seen. OK, it's installed on my machine. And basically, how it works is we're defining the language we want to use. So I'm saying English. And we're going to, to load Spacey with the English language. Now. And then I've created an example sentence called, this workshop is awesome. And now I'm parsing. I'm taking the sentence and putting it into my NLP um, Spacey corpus. So basically, what I've done is I basically said Spacey OK work with English language. And I'm giving you this English sentence and try to understand it with your knowledge of the English language. And for now, I've simply just said, OK, for every token in my document, in the sentence that I've just given it, just print the text. So what this results in, it is simply going to print every token. And if we speak about sentences, a token is a word. 
or a character or everything thing that is basically divided by the white space. So this would be this workshop is awesome is now the output of all of the tokens in our document. Okay, so far so good. That must have been very easy. We can now investigate much more information that Spacey, with its knowledge about the English language, has about the sentence. So it's numerous parts of um, data fields that we can access in our token. So every token, if we see it down here, also has the text. It also has an index, basically the starting point of each word, the lemma, the part of speech. This is really interesting. The dependency, which will then lead us to the dependency that I've shown you before. So let's run this code. And I get this, and this is a bit of formatting in case you're wondering what's happening here. This is just making this look like a nice table, basically. And so now I'm again going through each token. So this class is awesome dot, and I'm printing each bit of information that uh, we get from Spacey, right? So we get the lemma. So the lemma of is would be B. And we get the part of speech, so determina, noun, auxiliary, adjunctive, adjective, punctuation. And then we also get the determina, uh, the dependency, that will be useful for the dependency process. We get stuff like shape and is a character or is a stop word, something like this. This information has been explained up here above if you want to know more about it. So this is just to show now the capabilities of Spacey. Right? And then there is a cool feature of Spacey, for example, um, that allows you to do um, named entities. So basically, because it, because Spacey has been trained on the English language, it is capable of identifying certain entities, quantities, or um, yes, entities and quantities. So now I've given it the sentence. So I'm doing just the same again. I just bought two pairs of shoes from Amazon at 12 p.m. because the sale with 30% off was about to expire. I put this into my Spacey NLP. And for the document that I've just created, my under, understood document, I can now, now the difference is I'm saying dot ends, which gives me the entities. And then I'm printing the text and the label of those entities. And what this does now, it identifies two, or the two pairs of shoes, is a cardinal. Amazon is an organization. 12 p.m. is a time. And 30% is a percentage. So what does the U before the string denotes? That's a very good question that I've been asked before. Thank you for raising it, and I'll address it immediately. Uh, so the U is basically just a, an encoding. Um, so if you have different stuff in that string happening, it just makes sure that you're using the right encoding. To prove this, I can run the same code without the U, and it does the same trick. There is just a form of encoding. Um, but let's leave it there. OK, so if you want to know more about this, uh, if you want to know more about Spacey, right, I've given you all of the links. I cannot uh, explain the whole uh, Spacey here. But this is now really interesting to show you, because with Spacey, what we can do, um, what we can do is I can use the visualization of Spacey. So I can display stuff. So I can say from Spacey import displacey, right? And then I can say displacy.render. So please render the document, so the sentence that I've just created, and print it in the style of entities. So please show me the entities. And because we're working on Jupyter Notebook, I just have to say Jupyter Notebook, so Jupyter is true. So I say print now. And what we can see is this really nice rendering that indicates these blocks. And if you remember now from the part of the lecture that I've just showed you before, right, we have. Um, the cardinality, we have the organization, we have time and percentage. And this is what you could feed then into a knowledge graph. You have distracted the most important parts, and then you can, can use this to obtain more information. And now we can also um, not only visualize, recognize uh, entities, but also we can visualize the dependency relations that we have inferred from the model. So up above, I showed you that it is able to identify these dependencies, like the termina and what's uh, uh, and all these other things. So now to put this into what we've discussed in the lecture, if you remember those basic building blocks and the dependency, if I run this code and say displacey render now my document in the style dep for dependency and use here's a distance parameter to scale it. If I do this now, I uh, can get the rendering that I showed you in the lecture. 
So, and also to show you that I'm not fooling you, right? Uh, so if I get rid of, oh no, let's do this. If I get rid of this part of the sentence, while hunting, I shot an elephant in my pajamas. And if I run this, the dependency tree ch uh, changes, right? So now we have a different dependency tree. And if I go back, you can now see again, it changes the dependency. All right. Um, so these are the basic NLP concepts that I've discussed with you before that you can use with a library for, uh, such as um, Spacing. And um, now we talk about a little bit about word similarities because um, what I can, um, let me just quickly uh, stop the session, the, the instance that I'm running because I want to show you something else. So we're going to restart the runtime. So what you can do now is you can take one word and you compare one word to another word. That's a big thing you always want to do if you work with natural language processing. You basically want to assess the distance of words within a conceptual space. So how distant is the dog from the banana or how distant is the fruit from the banana, right? If you're comparing documents, if you're comparing words and you want to assess uh, similarities of those. Right, so what we're going to do for this is um, we quickly have to uh, import Spacey again. So we're saying import uh, Spacey. And now we are, uh, we are loading. I didn't download this before. I want to use a big language corpus for this comparison. So up here, I have this little cell that says Spacey download EN Core Web LG. And this basically means please download the English language Core Web Large Corpus. So this is about 800 megabytes. And this is directly loaded from the Spacey Git onto your Google instance. And this is about eight, uh, did I say gigabytes? I meant megabytes. 800 megabytes um, of uh, language, of a language model. Right? So after I've used this, and we will talk about language models a bit later, so just basically take it now as uh, we're loading a bigger understanding of the English language into Spacey, which allows us to make more accurate distinctions between the similarities we're now going to assess. So everything you've seen before has been done with a small language model. So small language model is capable of doing all of these things that I've just showed you. But now, since we want to do a similarity comparison, I'm just quickly downloading uh, a larger language model, which has a more precise uh, understanding. So after this is done, uh, I'm just quickly going to install it, and we can go down to this code. Um, so what I will do now, I will just take the word banana, dog, fruit, animal, and to be more precise of a dog, I'm taking Shiba, and we will compare, and this is what uh, Spacey does really easily, right? It computes the similarity. If I just now say, so I'm taking the word dog, I can convert it into my Spacey vocabulary unit, and I'm storing it in a variable called dog. And now I can just simply say dog.similarity animal or dog.similarity fruit. And it is comparing for me these uh, this, the similarities within the language. Download is it has now um, downloaded the whole language package. Let's show you how this is done, and in a second, it should be ready to go. Should not have cleared the output here anyway. So um, I can <laughs> give me one one second. Okay. Well. Let's go ahead for now. So if that's done, basically the output will look like this. So these are the numbers that come out of this comparison. So this is an image that I've created from, from the numbers and I will provide you with, you with the real numbers in a second. So what you can see here is that animal compares to animal with the value one, which makes sense, right? They have a 100%, so one um, similarity, and you can see the, yeah, the diagonal here being one because dog also compares to one with one uh, similarity, fruits with fruit, and then banana with banana. But now the interesting bits are happening in between those lines. So if you compare animal to dog, we have a higher similarity than comparing fruits to animals or even bananas to uh, animals. 
All right. So this is basically what you can get out of the visualization. So this visualization was unfortunately not created by the code. Um, and now we have installed. You can see now download and installation successful. So now fingers crossed. This is always a bit tricky when you do live coding. Yes, of course. It could not find the uh, large language corpus. I can promise I've run the same numbers on the code here. Um, it probably requires me to restart the instance. Um, I give it one last try, but you got to trust me on those numbers for now. And if I refresh the notebook, they should be there. And you will also see them if you have not cleared your um, cleared your output. Um, one last try. So I'm loading the large language corpus. And that has worked. And now I'm printing the similarities. And there we go. OK. Moment of anxiety here. So dog and animal, and these are then the numbers you get out of this language model, right? So you can see again, if I compare now dog to Shiba, we have a much higher similarity than comparing banana to Shiba. Right? Okay. Um, so now what is actually happening there? Why is this even possible? How can we do this? So now we have a closer look, and now I'm going to print the information that um, the dog and banana can give me. So if I'm printing this, let me quickly go down here. So we can see what I've printed now is I said, okay, for the token dog, print me the text and the vector shape and the vector itself. If I do this for dog, I get dog 300 and then 300 values. If I say this for banana, I get banana 300 and 300 values. And you might now be thinking, okay, like, what is going on? Why do I have 300 uh, values here? What is the vector? Why does this word relate to a vector? And how do these vectors can be compared by similarity? And this is basically what will lead us now to language models and then to word embeddings. So let me go to the second part. Um, let me go to the second part of this lecture. OK. Words embeddings and language models. Quick heads up. Uh, can you see my current slides, the word embeddings, language models? Yes, thank you. OK, word embeddings and language models. Now I'm going to make sense of what you've just seen. I hope to do so, at least. So the underlying assumption in word embeddings is called distributional, is, is, going, is referring to the field of distributional semantics. If I have a few linguists in the audience, uh, they might know what this would be about. Now. So this goes back to the sentence uh, coined by Firth in 1957, the word is characterized by the company it keeps. Okay, so what does this mean in distributional semantics? This is the most underlying assumption. So let's look at a word, for example, queen. Um, if I look at the word queen, somebody wanted to present. <laughs> if I look at the word queen, here are a few example sentences of the word queen. Presenting a feast fit for a queen, the peasants tried to make sure everything was in place for her majesty. Or the population of the colony increases fast and a well-grown nest contains a queen and the males. Um, right? So there's different types of queen here. And technically, we want to refer the to the queen as in like the monarch. Um, so now, if we take this um, underlying assumption and say a word is characterized by the company it keeps, and um, from that assumption, we now look at the company of those words. So for example, for the queen, we can look at, for a queen, the peasants. And what this thing is called a foregram, because it's taking the four neighboring words. We can also decide to have a five gram taking the five neighboring words, or a five gram taking only two neighboring words, or a 10 gram. Right? So we can basically decide what we mean by queen. Right? We could take the entire sentence as well. And this is what's called the Angram company, right? The company that it keeps, in this case, is the Angram that we decide um, by ourselves. So now let's look at the foregram neighborhood. But if we look at it, we see for a queen, the peasants. And we realize that the words for a, the, don't really give us any meaning because they are so common in the English language that they don't really help us understand the word queen. But the words feast, fit, peasants tried might be a bit more useful. 
Let's do this with another example sentence. And now we cross out all of the words again that do not uh, give us any more meaning. And we end up with approve, daughter-in-law, she, and happy. So now let's look at queen as a vector. So what does it mean? So we take queen and we basically now make a list of all of those words in our corpus. By corpus, I mean the text, the document that we're looking at. So I'm now writing down all of the words in our corpus, in our text, on one column. And I'm going to write down all of the words in our corpus on uh, all of the rows. Okay, rows and columns, right? So, and what I can do now is I can now, by statistical analysis, identify how often does one word co-occur with another word in its company, right? So now again, we see this nice um, probability of one, 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 one. Why? Because if we have queen in its, in its proximity, there is the word queen, right, with itself. So it always has this uh, one value there. Same for car with car, same for king with king, and so forth. And now if we look at queen, we can now identify that queen might more often co-occur with the word mother or with the word king, but less so with the word car or driving in all of the documents that we are currently looking at, right? So we can do now the same with king and identify, well, king seems to appear, appear more often with queen and more with reign than with mother, for example. So now we can sort of get a sense that if we were to do the same for car, car would probably be more often be associated with street or driving than with reign or queen, just as an example, right? So now we can basically take those vectors, a vector is in this case just a one-dimensional list of values. So we take those vectors for queen and we take the vector for king. And now I'm just using a mathematical notation, right? You can see that the only difference I get rid of this graphical stuff and I just make it a, a, a mathematical vector. So now I've defined this as a math mathematical vector of values for queen and a mathematical vector for king. And now I can say, so queen is now a vector of one times n dimensions, and king is a vector of one times n dimensions. And the dimensions now, the number of dimensions, would, in my example, relate to the number of words that I have in my entire document. But let's think about this for a little second. Isn't there a much smarter and better way to encode the knowledge that we have just given? Let's look at this example of three dimensions. So now I'm only taking those few words that I have here on the left-hand side, and I'm coding them with only three dimensions, the dimensions being human, city, and family. I just pick them. And I would argue that this gives me a much nicer encoding that is a bit more general, but also specific enough to see differences, right? So uh, human would relate more to queen, king, mother, and child, and city relates more to street and driving. These numbers are completely arbitrary, right? And you can arguably change them, right? But this is sort of like the intuition behind um, if you do this attribution. So now I've encoded this with uh, three dimensions. So let's say I'm taking four or more dimensions, and now I'm not deciding what dimension this is going to be, but I'm, let, I'm going to let statistical learning figure out how many dimensions give me the best approximation, okay? Or how can I basically, and this is what it is all about, um, take a lot of words, let's say the English language has, I don't even know, let's say there's 20,000 words in my document, in my text, and I want to represent those 20,000 documents in only, 300 dimensions, right? Um, this is what's called a word embedding. So a word embedding now, if you've heard that word before, is you take your words that you want and a list of words, here's just like how many, six, seven, eight, nine, and you let the algorithm, the neural network, figure out the best way to encode those lots of dimensions, let's say you have n 20,000 words, and you want to put them down to 300 dimensions, you're using what's called an autoencoder, 
that is then encoding all of these dimensions into pure dimensions. I can't go into detail in explaining you uh, the encoder uh, here, but this is what you can understand about a word embedding. And the most commonly, these are around 300 dimensions. So now I can, let's say, here's just another example. I take my words, I encode them in, let's say, seven dimensions. This is my word embedding. And now what this allows me to do, here's a bit of like vector, uh, vector ideas about it. So let's imagine we have three dimensions. I think you all can imagine three dimensions. That should be fine. Um, if I place my queen now in my three dimensions, we all would understand that, OK, my queen is just a point in my three-dimensional space. If it would only have three dimensions, I can just put it somewhere. Right? It could be here or there or here. So now bear with me if I tell you you can do the exact same thing with multiple dimensions. It doesn't matter. You can have 300, 3,000, 3 million dimensions. If the queen also has 300, 3,000, 3 million dimensions, you can just put the queen somewhere in the conceptual space, and it will be there, just defined by more dimensions. So why? why? Why are we doing all of this? Why we take a word, why we do all of the statistical parsing, put it in a word embedding, flatten it to 300 dimensions, putting it in a multi-dimensional space, just so we can say queen is now a vector. But this is exactly the crucial part. Because now we can do the exact same thing with a different word, for example, king. And I can put king also somewhere in my multidimensional space. And now if I just you know, reduce it and basically say, OK, now let's look at everything from like two, per, two, two dimensions. Right? Let's, let's boil it down. We can understand it works in multiple dimensions. But for the sake of the argument, let's just look at it from like two dimensions. Because we understand it works more. So now we look at it from two. And now I'm asking the question, how similar is queen, the word, to king, right? Or the question could be phrased differently. How similar is their position in the conceptual space? Or phrased differently, what is the cosine distance of the vector of queen and the vector of king? So everyone who had a bit of vector algebra knows that I can define the distance between those two points by looking at the cosine distance. So the cosine distance here is now this formula, but the easiest way to look at it, it is literally a cosinus of the angle between the two vectors, right? OK. If there's any mathematician in this audience who wants to say something now, please go ahead. I did not derive all of this by myself. This is based on like lots of literature, and you can read lots about it. But this is probably the understanding that you can still uh, talk about it and um, still be correct about it. This is literally what you do. You evaluate the cosine distance. And this is then the uh, numerical value for your similarity between those two concepts in a multidimensional space, in short. OK, so you can exactly calculate the similarity with it. I think that's a nice thing to do, right? But as it turns out, and this is really fascinating to me as well, right? we create this word embedding, and now we can observe certain phenomena. For example, if I'm in my space, floating somewhere here, and now I'm saying, OK, king is here, queen is there. If I go the same vector directionality in that conceptual space, so I'm basically remembering, OK, I have to go from my initial vector king, and now I'm doing the same walking from the um, point of men, it leads me to woman. Because eventually, the relation between king and queen is the same as man and woman in the conceptual space of the word embedding. And that same phenomenon could be shown with um, past and present relations. So if you go from the word swimming in the direction to swim, and you do the same kind of walk from walking to walked, you can identify the same. Um, relation here. OK. On top of that, so here's the example a bit more um, obvious. And this is like, I think, one of the most cited phenomenon when it comes to word embeddings. You could take the vector of um, king minus the vector of man plus the vector of woman. And the result is the vector of queen. So vector algebra allows um, operations on a semantic level of the word representations. And this, um, all of this um, 
this whole notion that I've just presented to you f f in the community has been most um, predominantly presented by uh, the Mikolov paper on the word embedding called word to vec So I've referenced here, you can find the references on top. It's a bit small, but if I share the slides, you can see this. Um, I get a question in the chat. Let me quickly see if I can respond to it. Kevin already took it over. Thank you very much. Um, I hope that answers it. So now an even cooler thing, personally, as also part linguist, I think, let's say we take the English word to vec, so we train our language model on the English language, and we do now the same thing for the Spanish language. Right? We take a Spanish corpus to our uh, word embedding, and now what you can interestingly find is that um, structures such as here, the numbers four, five, three, two, one, can be sort of mapped into a different language, right? So remember, this is no translation task. There's no translation in happening. And this is not, this has only been constructed by the company that a word keeps, right? I mean, probably it seems intuitive for non-linguists that, oh yeah, of course, it's just a different language. But there's this whole debate in linguistics of how do you, okay, are there actually universal traits to language, right? Here's another example. You can find the same word with horse, cow, pig, dog, and then you have this outlier being the cat. And you can find sort of like the similar um, structure in Spanish. Okay, this just is a little um, uh, intuition on top of it. Um, let me quickly uh, think something. Okay, so. Now we've seen this. So this is an example stack I took from a really nice paper, 2020 paper, a wide range screening of algorithmic bias in word embedding models. Um, we can see here now the example that I showed you before. So we can take words, we can put them into word embedding. Now basically what's happening here, all of those words, let's say they're in 20,000 dimensions because we have 20,000 words, they are being uh, encoded into seven dimensions in that case, so seven dimension reduction. And now those, again, those dimensions can be reduced from seven dimensions into two dimensions, just for the sake of visualization of the word embedding. And we can see here this example of man, woman, king, and queen. Uh, yes, so much for the word embedding. And now the stuff that I've showed you earlier, um, now to show you uh, the stuff from earlier, you probably have understood now what has happening uh, what was happening when I used the space here, when I showed you dog has uh, 300 uh, values, and these are the 300 values. So now, um, basically, it, you also can now make sense of this beautiful visualization. Right? Basically, what we've done here is we have located the dog in the conceptual space of 300 dimension, the banana in the conceptual space of 300 dimensions. We've taken the cosine similarity and we evaluated the distance or so to say, the similarity of those terms with the numerical value. So all of a sudden, this whole math behind it boils down to saying dog, dot, similarity, banana, and you get a value. So this is um, the similarities, similarity search, right? So imagine now, I have asked you previously, what is the similarity between banana and dog? But what now if you have a customer or a project in which there is someone who wants um, to find, uh, let's say here's a, an example problem, science fiction, right? He wants to find recommendations for the word science fiction. But now, um, but now this is more related in the conceptual space uh, to future than it is to earth science. But the latter has a word in common with the query, right? So it might end up being really skewed towards earth science, even though future would be more important for science fiction, right? So we, we're not sure, we kind of like have to search our entire multidimensional space for the nearest, right? Previously I said, how far is this from that? But now I'm saying, what is close to this one? So now I need to search all of the space around my, um, around my concept. This will be the problem example. So in, in a conceptual way, this example boils down to how does one quickly find the nearest embed? So if I say that my point in the space is an embedding, embeddings are often too large for an exhaustive search. 
cannot go through the entire worth embedding to find the nearest neighbor. So why am I even mentioning this is because last week, and also just to make to show you how important um, how important this this thing is, Google proposed a solution called Span Scalable Nearest Neighbor, and this was released uh, July twenty eighth. So last week, I think. And um, I quickly want to put this in. I reference the article. Um, so you basically have a model architecture consisting of two models. One is mapping. Uh, so you train both neural networks on your corpus. One is mapping the database into the embedding space. Yeah? And then the other time for your actual query, when somebody asks, oh, where is this going to? Then this other network is basically doing this, um, the, yeah, not the search. I mean, it's a bit more complex. So just if you want to know more about this, I can't go into detail, just to make sure or to show you that this is something um, cutting edge, right? Uh, net network architecture for word embeddings, identifying similarities, and so forth. OK. Um, yes. OK, so that was it for the word embeddings. And we take off from the word embeddings now to go to the language models. I hope most of you still bear with me and I didn't lose most of you speaking about multidimensional concept spaces. Um, if so, now it's going to be a bit different. We will stay at a more conceptual level. Um, so language models. Language models and word embeddings. What is the difference? So a word embedding, as we've previously understood, is a word meaning is derived from the sentence. Right? So we looked at the neighborhood in the sentence, and then we inferred the uh, word meaning. Now, um, this gives us a single vector of, um, uh, now this gives us a single vector of words in the em embedding. So if I'm saying I'm eating an apple and I have an apple phone, of course, we're talking about two different apples here, right? But in our uh, word embedding, this would be one spot in the word embedding, which can lead to problems, right? So Apple would here be just from one spot. Um, so basically, our word embedding allows us to estimate similarities in concept space. That's what we've been doing. On the other hand, a language model is now a neural network in order to predict the next word in a sentence, right? You can see it's completely different just by, uh, even by what it's supposed to do. So a language model is literally about generating text, generating um, uh, language, right? So this is trained on large corpora, and it is using word embeddings and neural networks to do that. Um, so now, again, word embeddings are more like for analyzing the semantics, and language models are more like for generating text. Also, you can analyze semantics. Um, all right, I'm seeing the chat a few curious questions, and Evan is responding for me. That's very nice. Thank you. So um, basically, this is an overview of a language model. It's, it looks a bit complex, but I'll walk you through. So you take lots of text, you put them into an encoder, you get embedding out of it. That was basically what I've said earlier, explaining word embeddings. Then you throw this into the actual decode into the language network, and then you get a new text. But now I have to state a disclaimer. There are very different versions, very different models very different approaches. They're also very recent and very fast evolving. So here's just an overview of what has happened in the last year or two. And there is this tendency of naming those language models after Sesame Street characters. So we have like Bert, Elmore, Ernie, and uh, things like this. And um, you can find more about this. I also linked the GitHub that explains a bit more about these uh, language models. Um, so this is just to say, if you see the language model here, Take it with a grain of salt. This is just like conceptual overview. And one specific language model um, that uh, caught my attention, at least, is the transformer model. And on top of what I've just presented, there's lots of little um, uh, bits and pieces in the transformer. But the most interesting part uh, that I found would be it also has an attention mechanism. And basically, the attention mechanism uh, is on top of the regular encoding. You can see here, like regular encoding the words into the embedding. It also passes keywords that are important to the semantics of the sentence directly into the decoder. 
because it knows what parts of the sentence are important to give the key terms, uh, give more context to the key terms. But this is just a very rough idea. You can find numerous articles that explain um, transformer models. There's a nice question. Is GPT-3 a language model? Exactly. And I will talk about the GPT series of transformer models now. So that was a good question. So basically, language model transformers. So this is the, the streamline. So you have a large corpus. You put it into your language model. You oh, basically, you create your language model with your large corpus. Then you can fine tune your model on a task specific data set. Say, again, you're teaching your model the English language. And then you want your model to answer questions or summarize text or uh, translate text. So you give it a task specific data set that is about summarization. Lots of examples of translation, lots of examples of um, interview questions or tweets. And then with this fine tuning, your final model then can generate output, can then generate tweets, answer questions, uh, translate text, right? And in theory, so the argument here by the people who build it, uh, who built these first transformer models was, okay, so I have a large model with a lot of parameters, lots of layers, structures, and complexity. So if I increase this model now really, 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 really big, and this is, uh, I'm talking about the paper called Language Models Are Unsupervised Multitask Learners. So the argument in this paper was basically, if you make your model big enough, you don't need to train it on anything. It kind of like implicitly, because it learns on so many levels how language works, that it will be capable of summarizing text, answering questions, uh, translating text, just because it is such a big, complex model. This is at least the argument. And here are a few examples from the GPT-2, which is a previous language model from last year, um, where basically that model was given this prompt that you can see on top of here. And from this prompt, um, it is able to generate uh, stories, right? So these are uh, entirely created by uh, the model itself. You can find a lot of examples on the link that I've shared here just to show you what it was capable of. It can generate a story from prompt. It can take a new snippet and can create more new snippets from those. It could you know, make your homework assignment. But if you read in detail, well, you can definitely see a lot of flaws with it. On the first instant, it looks really, really interesting. And most astonishingly, from an NLP perspective, these models were capable of uh, generating text that was coherent over more than three or four sentences, which was previously um, really hard to do. So I will talk about those examples uh, more in a, in a second. So what I want to say now is you have this large language model now. And again, you can use it for if you train it on a specific data set. Let's say you show the model a lot of fake news. Then the model, with its knowledge of the English language, is able to abstract from the English, English language to, to generate more fake news, just as an example. Now, the argument was, again, I said it earlier, greater model size means greater language capabilities, right? So now a little bit of a timeline. So the first language model with like 94 million parameters were, came out in like April 2018. And then we had GPT-2 with 110 million parameters. I mean, these numbers don't mean anything to you. but just as a scale, right? When this uh, was sort of like trend coming up, people building their language models, increasing their size, it was Elon Musk's founded uh, open AI company that thought, well, you know, we have the money, why don't we make a, a model that has 1.5 billion parameters? And that was GPT-2. And when GPT-2 was released, there were headlines like, new AI fake text generator may be too dangerous, and OpenAI has published a thing that is too dangerous, and can we even release it? And they really struggled uh, deciding, okay, should we release the 1.5 billion model? And they only released it in like a small version, a medium version. And then at some point, they wanted to finally release a large version. And this is the results that you have seen from, uh, I showed you earlier, text generation. But now, yeah. fast forward to May 2020, uh, well, we had 1.5 billion parameters. And then, well, OpenAI basically said, well, if we can create bigger models and they get those bigger language capabilities, how about 175 billion 
uh, and this is the correct, 175 billion parameters. And this is GPT-3's uh, latest model that they've just released um, a couple of months ago. And even for the release now, the difference here is now they have said, okay, we are too afraid that people will abuse this to create all sorts of spam, fake news, and whatever um, chatbots. So you basically have to join a waiting list, get approved by the company, and then you can start coding using their language model. And uh, here are just a few examples, right? There's this GitHub where somebody is collecting really nice example of GPT-3. And I just want to show you a few of those. So here's one um, where you can say, like, ask me anything. And basically, it returns you the information that you ask. It's basically like Google, but it does not build on anything. It's simply built on this one language model. Just by inferring from language, you give it a question, and it infers the answer because it technically has seen so many examples of how language works, but it is able to answer meaningful questions. So this is just one example. Um, mm -hmm. Is that 175 millions? No, it's 175 billions. Sorry, I'm just following up with the. What does it mean, parameters? Maybe Kevin can take this question. Uh, which language was used for this search engine? OK, I will ask, uh, respond to those questions in a bit. Um, let's go for the, um, for the uh, next example here. I hope that image is loading. It is. Not, unfortunately. OK, then we skip to the next one. This one is loading. So basically, the example here is now even more crazier. This is, yeah. So what you can do is you can, in natural language, describe a neural network that you want to build. So you can say, like, build me a neural network with three layers and five hidden layers and a data set of 200 by 200 pictures, as you can see here. You just generate the model. And because also included in all of the language corpus that it learned, it was also fine-tuned on, right? I mean, you can imagine all of GitHub, where all of the people put their code. It is basically trained on fine-tuned on this. So it is able to generate um, program code by clicking a button. Right? It's inferring the semantics from the sentence and turning it into code. And here, the um, fancy title was AI Inception. Uh, right? It's using AI to build AI. Ah, now this other has loaded. So you can say, a button that looks like a watermelon. And you press Generate, and it generates the actual JSX code for you, because it has also been fine-trained uh, on on trans translating comments of web developers into code. So this is uh, where we are um, right now. So this post has been uh, published July 13th. Um, OK, so pre-trained language models. I also, because we are AI for people, and I also I need to make everyone aware of things that uh, can be too dangerous, right? With great power comes great responsibility. And if I talk about language models, I have to uh, tell you that there's nice studies showing that there's an inherent bias in these language models because it has been trained on a lot of web uh, text as well. So here, for example, uh, if you ask the system, the man worked as, and then you let the system autocomplete, well, the man worked as a car salesman in a local Walmart, but the woman worked as a prostitute under uh, the name of Harya. Right? So this is an inherent bias in the model. And I don't even want to mention these other um, dreadful examples. OK, and then the other, um, you can find the paper linked here. The other example that I need to highlight, the other danger is, so somebody did a few calculations. So he took the amount of training days, calculated the amount of energy consumption, and he basically inferred that if he's accurate, that's roughly, so training GPT-3, Took roughly the uh, took roughly the same amount of energy to launch twenty SpaceX Falcon Nine rockets, right? But here I have to say in, in defense, right? You only train once. You only train GPT three one time, and then after it's trained, all of the inferences, all of the thing you've seen before, um, is not as cost effective, right? Of course, there's a bit of computing power happening when you infer, especially with such a big language model, but the actual one-time training 
is taking a lot of energy. Um, all right, so now, uh, now we've covered word embeddings and language models. In the next part of this lecture, which will be at 11.30, I wanted to analyze a bit of NLP right, and actually apply NLP to um, all of this, uh, to data, to Twitter data. I wanted to show you how to use the Twitter data. I have a corpus and everything. Turns out um, we can't do this, right? Why can we not do this? Because Twitter says in its content redistribution, you are only allowed to distribute tweet IDs, direct message IDs, and user IDs. So you are not allowed, I am not allowed to share the tweets that I have collected over weeks and weeks and weeks and tedious work um, to share this nice corpus with you. But you can't violate a data policy if the data has been invented by an AI. That was my thinking. So what I have been doing in preparation for this workshop, and I think it's really nice because we're actually now using um, what I've been, uh, I've been showing you, right? You take the GPT-2 model, that's what I've been doing, you fine tune it on my Twitter corpus that I have created. And then the final model gives me a new corpus that is based on this Twitter data that I can share with you because it's not actual real tweets. It's completely fake uh, hallucinated tweets by a language model. It's just simply trained on my corpus. So that way, yeah, modern problems require modern solutions. That's a good phrase. All right, so that way I can actually share my Twitter my fake Twitter corpus with you and analyze it. So for this, I've been using, and I have to uh, highlight this here, um, Max Wolf is a really uh, cool scientist who shares a lot of his stuff, um, also in really nice accessible blog posts and um, cookbooks the way that I've been using them. And he's created how to build a Twitter text generation got with GPT-2. And um, so all the credit for this next thing that I'm going to show you goes to him. So I've been using his code uh, in this cool collab. You can also find the same collab. I've linked it as well. Um, and now we only have five more minutes. I was a bit short on time. So I'm just, and I didn't want to speak about this in detail anyway, because um, again, his tutorial is really good. You can just take his notebook and do the same thing as well. All I want to show you, um, all I wanted to show you is what I've done, so I have used GPT, and the simple thing is you say, install GPT-2 simple, simple model of the simple version, import GPT-2 as GPT-2, right? That's the model. I've been using a graphics card because then the training is faster. I've downloaded the medium-sized model of GPT-2, oops, sorry, which is 355 million parameters. And then, da -da -da, let's skip this. Uh, you have to insert, so this is my, uh, uh, my tweets, this is my tweet corpus, and now I have fine-tuned the tweet corpus, and it's basically just saying gpt fine tune and then you have to fill in a few parameters. You can read about the documentation. Everything is neatly explained. You insert your file, you specify the model you want to use, training steps you want to do, and a few other parameters, and then training begins. And this is where the fun starts. So you can see here the training going on, and at a certain point I want to say, okay, after 500 steps, show me the tweets you've generated, and these are the already first generated fake tweets. So you have something like, a person like your wife may be, may be immune and may have been infected by the COVID virus, but has gotten sick. Okay, for me, that's sort of like an acceptable fake tweet. Uh, you can also see that Donald Trump seems to be very uh, present in this discussion. But um, of course, we continue training for a while, and then we can get all of these nice more samples. I've been training and training and training this for a while. So this thing was running for a couple of hours, all on the Google Notebook, all provided by Google. So I didn't need to, to run anything on my computer. Right? So you can do this on even on your phone if you can access the Google Notebook there. And then once it was done, I have, um, but this specific notebook is not on the GitHub repository. It is from Max, right? But I can link this. I'll provide you with the link later. Um, and now, after it's done, I can say GPT-2 dot generate with the run session I've been previously running, and then I can generate all of my fake tweets. And um, yeah, then I've generated all of those fake tweets. I save them into a file, and I've generated for you guys. 25,000 fake coronavirus tweets. And by coronavirus, I will talk with you 
in uh, the analysis session. Is there anything else on my list? No, we run out of time. We do not have time for questions. I mean, we do have time for questions, but I think uh, shout out to Kevin. He did a phenomenal job in responding to most of the questions. And I would actually have more time in the next session uh, to answer more questions at the end of the next second session. Feel free to post the questions in the chat. Nonetheless, I'll stick around for a few more minutes. I'll also take a little break. And I will keep this meet session open, so you do not need to go in and out. I will just mute myself, prepare everything for the next lecture. And then we will continue this. Where, where can we find our classes on coding? Your classes on coding. You mean my coding class? Um, OK, I will respond to this after the, I finish here. So I will keep the, um, I will keep the meet open. I will see everyone who wants to see how to analyze uh, Twitter data with NLP tools and topic modeling on them at uh, 11 a.m. And uh, yeah, feel free to spread the word. We're only 80 people, so you can invite all of your colleagues that have missed the first part. Uh, the second part will be sort of independent. It will be about analyzing tweets, but now you've understood um, a bit more about NLP, I think. And again, yeah, feel free to post questions. I will respond to your replies now in the chat. And you can stay in the meet if you want. I will keep it open. And uh, thank you for your attention. I'll see you at 11. OK, uh, I pro might have said 11. I meant 11.30. Thank you very much. 11.30, <laughs> yes. OK, 11.30.